Oh, okay. One, two, three. Good morning. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, I don't know. That thing is, this is loud. I don't know if I'm going to use it. Can you all hear me? Yeah. It's birthday and anniversaries today. We're going to have those in a minute. This is awful. I did have something, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, next week is annual conference. And the, it's really strange the way they're doing it this year. Um, it's online or in person. You can do it either way. I am going because it's, in the, it's at the Mesa Civic Center, about three miles from my house. <laughs> So I have no excuse. <laughs> um, that means I will be not in the office as much as usual. Um, and Sunday, I'm not sure what time the closing service is on Sunday. I forgot to look it up. I think it is, it's usually around 10.30. So I will be, I will be here next Sunday, but I will be leaving 
uh, almost immediately, yeah, immediately, and there will be no class next Sunday for that reason. Um, and I want to, the following Sunday, I should have a report, a verbal report, it won't be complete, but to tell you what went on, um, who shot who and all that stuff, because uh, quite honestly, it, it gets very, very um, agitated sometimes. And I, I have been known to walk out because I, there's things that are said sometimes that I don't agree with. But anyway, hopefully, we have not had an, a real annual conference for some time. Hopefully, there will be a little more civility now we're back. Janine is your uh, representative from the congregation. Each church gets uh, a clergy and a lay representative. And if you have more than, I think it's 300 members, you get an extra lay representative for each 300 members. So we're, uh, we're a little short of that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Janine will um, have to present a lay person's report and I'll have to present a clergy report. So, because we actually at times go different ways. The, the first opening thing is we have a, bless you, <laughs> we have a clergy session to begin with and a lay session. So there are two sessions going on um, as the opening of the annual conference. It's quite honestly, it's a long time since I went to one uh, because I haven't been active, but I remember how it goes. So that's the, the news now. Um, and say I should be here next Sunday, uh, but I will have to go back again to attend the closing session because believe it or not, that's the most important thing <laughs> is the closing session. Um, hopefully this year we will know when the general conference is and when the jurisdictional conference is. Because I don't know if you realize it, but the Methodist Church right now is very short of bishops. Um, that's why we're sharing one with California. Um, and the only time you can elect a bishop is at the jurisdictional conference, which has to come before the general conference. They're talking about a general conference next year which will be strange because that's an odd year and normally they're on even years it should have been in 2020 but we didn't do it because of covid 2024 is the the next one but that's you know it'll be eight years without a general conference so i think they will want to have a general conference conference before that and a jurisdictional conference to um, create more bishops if you will because we need them I think we will leave it at that. I'll shut up for a while. See my wife back there going. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Michael, let us continue with music to prepare our hearts.
So as always, thank you, Michael. If you're comfortable standing, would you do so for the call to worship? Children of God, sing to the Lord. We shall sing, sing to our Father, Father while yet, while yet we, we have life. Joint heirs with Christ, sing praise to your God. We shall sing, sing to our, our Mother while we, we have breath. May the, May the glory of God, of God endure, endure forever. May, May the, the world rejoice in the works of God's, God's hands. hands. And remain standing for the hymn in the United Methodist Hymnal 699. Come and let us sweetly join. Verses 1 to 3, 699. Please be seated. Well, Prayer Bear got a few messages this week, so um, I'm going to read the prayer requests. Uh, oh, I've got one I need to add. Um, i got a quick prayer request for Alice Wagaman asking for prayers for Lindsay, who's battling cancer and not expected to recover. Family are with her and she is in the ICU. She has a husband and two young children. That's, I don't know what relationship this person is to Alice, but Alice is obviously concerned. Also, Ken and Nancy January are asking for prayers for a 14-year-old, oh, I beg your pardon, 94-year-old um, friend who keeps losing blood and is recovering and is receiving blood transfusion at Northwest Hospital in Tucson. His name is Charles Adler, and he is one of the few remaining World War II veterans. And... Uh, you know, that, that generation is, we're losing them. Um, pray for Charles Adler and Alice Wagamans, friend Lindsay, and also many of you know Little lady usually sits over here with white hair, and when I say little, she's quite little. Ellie is participating in a triathlon next Sunday, and we will be able to note her progress because there is, you know, there's an app for everything. If you have a cell phone, there's an app for everything, and you can track it on a a thing called Marathon Tracker. And I will have it on my phone up here next Sunday. So I'll keep you posted as well. But <laughs> she asked for prayers not to win. She says, I don't expect to win. She says, I want to be safe. I was talking to her as I was coming in this morning. Um, and she said, I just want to be safe. And I pray that no one else gets hurt because it is... What it starts out with a 
See, it's a foot race of 54 miles, a bicycle race of 30-something, I think. No, I got that the wrong way around. It's a bicycle race of 54 miles, a foot race of a, a half marathon, which is 13.2 miles, and then a, a swim, which is just over a mile. And there is a sequence, and I said to her, <laughs> be sure you dry off well after the swim, otherwise you could get awful sore. <laughs> but she is, this is something she does. And uh, Ellie is, um, I don't know if I'm giving any secrets away, but she's uh, around 70. And she's been doing this for years. She's done many, many of these marathons marathon and half marathon and this is an iron man what's called a half iron man and it's quite a an achievement i think just to finish how many of you could run that far <laughs> how many of you would want to run that far <laughs> but this is what she does and uh we talked about it quite a lot because I was interested in the cycling part because that's what I used to do many years ago, many, many years ago. But this week, she's in training this week and she said she's going to be training every day up to Friday. And then she said Saturday is rest day. That's when you regenerate for the event on Sunday. She will start at 6.30 local time. Now she's in Maryland, so I don't expect you'll be up for the start. <laughs> But by the time we get into church, she said she should be on the bicycle. That's the last part of it. And uh, I said, we will pray for you for safety. And but just, you know, a feeling of self-satisfaction at having been able to complete it. Um, also, I have one other praise, really. My friend Bobby back there. Bobby was in church last Sunday and she was in a lot of pain. Her neighbor, I suggest, probably nagged her <laughs> to going to urgent care and they gave her a shot and some pills and she's feeling a lot better. How much better, Bobby? That much? That much. <laughs> yeah, I, I know... I know she was in pain last week, I could tell it on her face, but she's doing really well. So praise God for that. Okay. There are things that are on your hearts and minds, I'm sure. So will you take a few minutes in silent prayer? Amen. Will you pray with me the prayer of the people? O oh God, the earth is full of your creatures. In wisdom you have made us all, and you have delivered us into one another's care, asking only that we love one another as you first loved us. We have fostered discord rather than unity, contempt rather than respect, ignorance rather than love. Communities, peoples, creatures, lands, seas, they have been set apart or torn apart or driven apart by conflicting claims and thoughtless ambitions. You know our works and our thoughts. Lord, so do this day as you have promised. Gather us all, your, your tribes and tongues, and restore us to harmony. Reconcile us to your spirit of peace, and from the new moon and, yeah, to Sabbath, all flesh shall worship your name.
The scripture that Jim's going to read this morning is really about the beginning of the church. Uh, It's got some horrible, awkward words in it, for which I apologize to Jim already. (laughs) And he said he'll do his best with them, but they are, you know, they are basically names, names of places. So uh, you don't have to shout out corrections. (laughs) Jim, please. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven, living in Jerusalem, And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're comfortable standing, would you stand for we are the church? And I think the number is 558 instead of 588. 558 and verses 1, 2, and 5. 558. Church. 
Please be seated. You may have noticed I did a little bit of word swapping here. Instead of Acts of the Apostles, I said Acts of the Holy Spirit, because that's really what this is about. What did the Holy Spirit do? Several times during his ministry, Jesus promised the disciples that he would send a helper, a comforter, a guide to help them when he was no longer with them. I can imagine to them, you know, it was, they realized they had a responsibility to carry on Jesus' work. But you know, these were fishermen and, you know, odd job men and who knows what. You know, they were not trained preachers, they were not trained teachers, but they had had three years, almost like a junior college course, you know, three years in ministry <laughs> with Jesus, the Master. So what were they to do? Jesus said, I'll, you know, I will make sure you have some help. I will make sure that you have a helper. Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem, which was logical, really, because that's where the, the latter part of Jesus' ministry had centered, and they were there. And also there was a large crowd of people there because this was a special week for them. Also, as they waited in Jerusalem, they had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about each other, decide where they were going to go. You know, okay, you, you go over there, I'll go east, you go north. They had the opportunity to decide that, which direction they were going to go. And no one had told them, you know, you must go in this direction. Also, they had something else important to do. What was that? They had to choose a successor to Judas. See, Judas, I always think of Judas as a kind of a placeholder, you know, <laughs> until they could get someone who were, could really do the job. Choosing a successor, you know, how do you choose a successor? You've got these 11 disciples who have been through the full three-year course. What do we need to do? Well, we need to find someone who's been around through that three-year course, although they weren't officially the disciples, or part of the disciples, but they had been there. And that person was Matthias. He had traveled with them. He had seen all the miracles that Jesus did. He had seen the, the healings. He had seen Jesus in ministry. So they had an idea of what needed to be done. And it says, it, I don't think it actually says in the, in the earlier reading how they chose Matthias, but they took, I don't have one here. The way they chose, they didn't have any dice. So they couldn't say, okay, we'll shake the dice and see what comes out. But they didn't have a cup. And what they did, they took each person in consideration, they took a stone to represent that person and they wrote their initial on it. Then they put them in a cup. And this may sound simple, but this is the, this, you'll understand how they cast lots. Because they swept the cup around as hard as they could until one fell out. And that was God's choice. That was casting lots. Matthias was the lucky one to be chosen. They spent their waiting time because they didn't know when this, this thing was going to happen that Jesus had promised. They spent their time reading, praying, talking with each other about things that Jesus had done things that he had said to make sure that they were all, as it were, on the same page, almost. 
and they talked to other people who were part of the group, especially the women. <coughs> there were three women that we know of, <coughs> pardon me, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. I was talking to someone the other day about Mary Magdalene, and I said, you know, Mary, <coughs> Mary gets a bad rap. Um, she was probably not a prostitute, as a lot of people think. The reason she got that handle, if you will, was because she came from Magdala. Now, Magdala is a village which used to be on the Sea of Galilee. I know that sounds silly, but the, sea of Gal the level of the Sea of Galilee has dropped. And Magdala is no longer <clears throat> on the coast. <laughs> it's inland a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to have a good cough. <coughs> okay, let's try again. Um, and Magdala was a, a port on the Sea of Galilee. And what do you get in ports? You get a lot of sailors, right? Now these were Romans. And there were women who lived in Magdala who were known to associate with the Roman soldiers and sailors. And that's why Mary gets this bad rap. But it's not really, there's, there's nothing we are told anywhere that guarantees that. Chapter 2 begins where Jim began reading. On the day of Pentecost, which is a Jewish festival of 50 days. Penta comes from the, I'm not sure it's Greek or Latin, I think it's Greek actually, uh, from the word pent, which is five. Penta is 50. And what it was actually was What's seven times seven? Quick, come on. Oh, some of you said 70. <laughs> 49 days plus one extra day because Pentecost officially started the day after the first Sabbath after Passover. You got that? <laughs> it, it was one of those things that had to be calculated. Well, later it changed and the um, rabbis decided, no, that's too complicated, we'll forget that. So we'll just set, we'll, we'll set a date, set a day for it. And that's what they did. So, but the first, the first time it's in a voice of significance is when Jesus said, on the day of Pentecost. So that's how they came up with that. Now there are three significant festivals. You know, you were required to go to the temple in Jerusalem. If you were a Jew, you were required to go on at least one of those festivals each year. And the festivals are uh, Pentecost, Passover, and Tabernacles. You probably never heard of Tabernacles. That's the day that the Jews erect a little tent outside their house and they supposedly live in this little tent for a week. It's to symbolize the time they spent in the desert living in tents. <coughs> Gee, this is not good. You may not be familiar with the Feast of Tabernacles at all because Hallmark hasn't figured out a way to make it a paying holiday. Now, unlike uh, uh, Hanukkah, which is the Jewish Christmas, you know, they have Jewish, they have Hanukkah cards, they have Hanukkah gifts. You go to Israel, you ask a Jew, a devout Jew will know that it's the Feast of Hanukkah anyone else in the street. Huh? What? Oh yeah, Hanukkah. Heard of that. But it's not celebrated. 
So on the first Pentecost after the resurrection, it's of great importance to us as Christians in this day and age because it was promised by Jesus, although not exactly named. On that day, we are told the disciples are all gathered together and suddenly there's a mighty rushing wind and tongues of flame settled on the heads of the disciples. That we might say was the outward manifestation of the inward effect that it had on them. That's the Pen Pentecost Sunday. Guess what colors we use? Which is the color of? Fire, Fire exactly. First <laughs> Sunday I came here, and this was in July, Pentecost remembers at the beginning of June, there were red streamers all over the place here. And my first thought was, gee, what a fire hazard. <laughs> I was hoping that Michael had a fire extinguisher under the piano just in case. <laughs> but that, I saw one display on Pentecost Sunday which really was interesting. They had these, they had these big fans, you know, the big, about two foot round fans. They were laying back there and to the grid of the fan were red and yellow ribbons. So when the fans were turned on, these things shot up in the air. Very effective. But that is the significance of the red. It's the fire. Not only that, but now the disciples found they were able to speak in different languages. These are not educated people except for a couple. And suddenly they know how to speak foreign languages. Boy, French class was never that easy. But this is something which is amazing, really. There are a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time. And there are people from all over, as Jim read, you know, I think there's 14 different, from 14 different countries. Now some of them speak a similar language. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a big language barrier, particularly between Hebrew, Greek, Latin, which is what the Romans spoke or a form thereof, and Arabic completely different, not just the words, but the syntax, the meaning of certain sounds. So they can, they find, they can speak these different languages and understand what they're saying, because that's important too. If you ever travel to a country where you don't speak the language, you tend to feel a little bit intimidated, don't you? What are these people talking about? Are they talking about me? <laughs> and then suddenly you hear your own language being spoken by a group. What do you tend to do? You gravitate to those people because you can understand what they're saying. It's scary being in a place where they don't speak your language. Um, but if you do hear them, do hear your language, that's a comfort. But the people who are visiting Jerusalem for the festival are from so many different countries, speaking so many different languages. There are at least six different languages involved here and dialects thereof. The excitement within the crowd must have been amazing when they started to hear the gospel preached in their own language. The chances are some of them knew Hebrew because they, they're Jews and they, they're coming from all places for the Jewish festival. And even you know, people who are not from Israel, if they are Jewish, they know some Hebrew. 
when I was traveling, I found the most important thing is to know how to order food and water. That way you won't go hungry. <laughs> So the world now, through these 3,000 odd people who now, hearing the word of God, become Christian. They say, yes, we want to be baptized. We want to be Christian. We hear the word of God in our own language. So there are 3,000 converts in one day. It's quite amazing. The only person who ever came close probably was Billy Graham to converting that many people in such a, a short time. So now the world learns of the good news, the works of the Savior, the promised one. God sent his son into the world that all the world might be saved. Not just a few, but all the world. God promised so many years ago salvation is at hand for those who will believe that's all you've got to do isn't it amazing that's all you have to do is believe and you're saved just believe and God did not promise salvation just to the Jews but to all who believe in him. Isn't that amazing? Even those who had not been through all the trials and tribulations that the Jews had endured were still part of God's kingdom. <clears throat> Do you not find it amazing how the God of the Jews is now also the God of the Gentiles in one day, just like that, the day of Pentecost? And God treats all who love him equally. See, there were some Jews who said, well, we're converting. We are going to be Christians, followers of Christ. But you guys were not <coughs> Jews. You can't just come in and be a Christian. And the apostle said, yes, you can. All you need to do is believe. How many of you know someone who was a Jew and then became a Christian? Some of you remember Louis Lyon, don't you? <laughs> Louis was a, f a good friend of mine, still is. I spoke to him just the other week. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he was, a, he was raised Jewish. And uh, when he became a Christian, his uh, <clears throat> parents disowned him. But I think they, they took him back. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that happens. That people think this is ours and ours alone. God never said that. God said the love of God is for everyone. All who believe. Remember how some in the crowd had said, these guys have got to be drunk. They're babbling away. We don't understand them. Some of the other people did, but certain people didn't understand them. And they said, they must be drunk. And then Peter, good old Peter, stands up and says, oh, excuse me. He said, the bars are not open yet. They don't open till after nine o'clock. The nine o'clock is significant because... <clears throat> Nine o'clock is the hour of prayer. Now a Jew would not eat or drink anything until after morning prayer at nine o'clock. So how could they be drunk? It's only nine o'clock in the morning. That made a few people think. This is the ful fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. How many of you read the book of Joel regularly? No, <laughs> not something we do, is it? It's not a thrilling book. It is a book of prophecy. Now, <clears throat> the true test of a prophet is that everything he prophesies 
must come true. Okay? You have to, that is a requirement of a true prophet. Everything must come true. And then there's this one about your young people shall see visions and your old people shall dream dreams. This is the last of Joel's prophecies. The last one to come true, I should say. And now the legacy is complete. A prophet is not a true prophet unless all that he prophesies comes true. As we move through the passage, we encounter the the speech of Peter. Now, it's, it wasn't included in what we had today, but it will be later. <clears throat> Peter, who has become the spokesperson for the disciples, in which he first repudiated the idea that the disciples were inebriated, got rid of that one, and then he goes on to tell the listeners that it is not necessary to be Jewish in order to participate in the blessings of God. Or to put it simply, you don't need to be a Jew first before you become a Christian. This disturbed the righteous Jews. And it was a front to those who assumed that they were the sole heirs to the kingdom. Can you imagine how down how downtrodden they must have felt at that point. So what can we take away from this scripture? I think it's pretty simple. First, we are all God's children. Would you agree with that? Second, God loves us all, Jew or Gentile and all the rest. Third, our God is an awesome God. What's the hymn? Our God is an awesome God. Yeah. I'd love that because <clears throat> it doesn't leave any room for maneuvering. Our God is an awesome God. No question. I think that's the, ta the takeaway for today. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Amen. Make sure I get the correct order now. <clears throat> of all the things I've missed, I've never missed the offering yet, I don't think. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the ushers will come forward, please, to receive the morning offering. Can we join in with you on this? Susie, can we join in on this one? Absolutely. Okay. We're all faithful. <laughs> Thank you. Let me make sure you get here in one piece. <laughs> Since we are so small in number at this time of year, Please dig down deep for your deepest voice and join us when, when it's time, okay? Okay, thank you very much, dear heart. Of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I will make the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I say is I am It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave. Oh, 
gifts we bring. Bless the givers, bless those unable to give. We ask that these gifts may be used for your work in this parish, around this country, and throughout the world, that all may know the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. By the way, that, that hymn, It Is I, Lord, is sung at every annual conference in this conference anyway and you should hear the gusto it's mainly the clergy that sing it and uh, when it says here are my lord all the hands go up and wave in the air and it, it is just a quite a spectacle to see um, makes me gives me a little bit of a shiver when i hear that but uh, we are going to use um, the Holy Communion setting that is on uh, page. Oh, I lost my page. The one that's on page begins on bottom of page fifteen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. As we give our thanks and praise, you know, this is not a separate part of the communion service. This is our thanks and praise and everything that goes with it is a, it's a continuous part. Now this is a special occasion. Not only is it the first Sunday of the month, but it's also Pentecost, the birthday of the church. So if you will join me in the, as the liturgy continues on page 16. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us away from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember how on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus sat with the disciples. His last meal with them, they didn't really know it, but Jesus certainly did. He took a loaf from the table Similar to this, but an unleavened loaf. 
He blessed it before his father, saying, Blessed are you, O God, who have caused the earth to bring forth grain, that we might have bread. And then he broke the bread. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They must have been a little bit shocked, amazed at what Jesus said. But then things got even more interesting because at the end of the meal, Jesus took the last cup from the table, Elijah's cup. And there must have been whispers going around, he's not going to, is he, is he, is he, is he going to do this? Because no one touched this cup or drank from this cup except the one who said, the Messiah is present. But he did. He did exactly that. He took the cup and he blessed it before his father, saying, Blessed are you, a God, who have caused the earth to bring forth grapes, that we might have wine. Then he passed it around to them and said, This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now we are the many. We are those who Jesus was talking about. He knew that you'd be here 2,000 years later. He looks into all hearts and he knew that you would be here. So this meal is for you. Prepared by Jesus. Take a eat and drink. Will the ushers come forward please? As always there are gluten free elements here for those who need them. If by any chance there are none left in the basket when you when it gets to you, just tell the ushers and they will they will find some because there's um, there's twenty cups here all together of gluten free, so you should have enough. Body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of the Lamb 
poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink ye all from this. Almighty God, thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you for the gift of your church. And thank you for this holy meal. Bless it to our bodies and us to your service. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. I love that hymn. It's a good old Methodist hymn. Yeah. Number 672. Will you stand as we sing together? special thank you to those who helped to make this service work, to Michael, our pianist, to our song leaders, I can't see them right now. Uh, ah, there you are, there's a hand waving above the crowd. Um, to those who helped prepare the communion, to our bookkeeper, who is also our secretary and our bulletin writer, printer and copier and, uh, and there's one guy let's see where'd he go who spends Thursday morning when he's at the church folding the bulletins <laughs> you know you don't think of all these things that have to be done but <clears throat> it's important that we have a worship service that flows somewhat <laughs> I'm just here to interrupt things but <laughs> Let's be thankful for them in all that we do. Father God, we thank you for this church, for our time together, for the God that you are, that we are able to worship freely and to show our faith by loving one another in all the things that we do. 
Lord, bless us as we go on our way this week. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.